Topping today's news, in a surprising move, Parliament was prorogued on Saturday. We get reactions from the official opposition. President of the Teachers Union expressed concerns as the new school year approaches. We get an update on maintenance and an up-close look at the Wartilla generators at BPL. And uh, bankrupt FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried arrested for tampering with witnesses. <laughs> Good evening, Bahamas. I'm Jarino Saunders. This is your JCN Evening News. It is a pleasure to have you join us. The last parliamentary session is now done away with, and the slate wiped clean with a new session of Parliament to commence on October 4th. This past Saturday, on the advice of Prime Minister Philip Davis, Governor General Sir Cornelius A. Smith prorogued Parliament. On the steps of the House of Assembly, Commissioner of Police Clayton Fernander, in his capacity as Provost Marshal, read a proclamation on behalf of the Governor General. Governor General of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, proclamation. There is Article 66 1 of the Constitution provides that the Governor General, acting in accordance with the advice of the Prime Minister, may at any time, by a proclamation, prorogue. Parliament. Now, therefore, I, Cornelius A. Smith, Governor General of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, acting in accordance with the advice of the Prime Minister, do hereby prorogue Parliament as from Saturday, the 12th day of August 2023, given under my hand and the public seal of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas at Government House in the city of Nassau this 12th day of August 2023 and in the first year of His Majesty's reign, God save the King. In some quarters, there is speculation that current deputy to the Governor General, Cynthia Mother Pratt, will be named as the Governor General and read a new speech from the throne when the new session takes place in October. In a statement on Saturday afternoon, Prime Minister Davis outlined his government's accomplishments over the last two years, noting that at the start of his New Day administration, the country was in a serious crisis and his administration moved quickly to revive the nation. The statement goes on to say that the Davis administration's blueprint for change continues to provide the foundation for progress. However, Prime Minister Davis says there is much work to be done during the new opening of Parliament with priority on new legislation and policies which address the high cost of living and national security. Prior to the opposition lambasting the government's decision to prorogue Parliament, Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs Senator Ryan Pinder on Saturday told reporters that the government is focusing on new legislative priorities and agenda. A.G. Pinder outlined accomplishments of the Davis administration since September 2021. Years ago when we came to office, um, you would recall we were still under curfew. We were still under emergency orders. Uh, the country was still constrained, uh, both economically and, and, and society, from a societal point of view, uh, with respect to the heavy-handed approach that the former administration took with respect to COVID-19. Uh, quickly upon coming to office, uh, the first day we lifted the curfew, uh, we went ahead and we opened up the jurisdiction. Uh, we lowered VAT. Uh, right away in order to be able to provide a stimulus to the economic rebound for the country. We put Bahamians back to work, uh, having the lowest unemployment rate in recent history in the Bahamas right now. Uh, all of the hotels are full. All of the financial services industry is doing well. The construction industry is booming. If you want a job, you can find a job, maybe two or three. Uh, so we thought coming out of the emergency situation in which we found ourselves that we they needed a progressive and an aggressive government uh, to be able to open the jurisdiction up to see the successes we have today. Uh, As for the pending legislation that was on the table in the lower chamber prior to the proroguing of the House, Attorney General Pinder says those bills will be brought back. Absolutely. Everything that was on the table that is being left, as you know when you prorogue Parliament, any bills left on the table go away. Uh, we will bring all of those back. Uh, we will bring certainly the Mining Act back um, to be debated early on in the session. Uh, that provides a framework for 
uh, exploitation of our natural resources, uh, whether that be aragonite, sand, aggregate, salt, whatever you mine the earth for, that will provide a proper framework for transparency and regulation. We will bring that back early in the session. Uh, we have a compendium of anti-corruption legislation. Uh, you would have noted the ombudsman bill was, is left on the table. Uh, we look to compound that with a new public disclosure act um, and an uh, anti-whistleblower act, as well as a um, code of conduct for the public service and bring that all back together uh, as an anti-corruption suite of legislation. Senator Pinder also noting that the national health care bill will be a part of the priority agenda. Now there has been speculation as to why the House was prorogued including a possible reshuffling of the cabinet or impending election. A.G. Pinder says he does not foresee any of that happening. Nothing in law. Um, you were just um, speculating and certainly uh, you're allowed to speculate. Um, I wouldn't think that any of uh, the things that you have mentioned um, really are any reason for proroguing the House today. Mm. Uh, I don't foresee a by-election. Uh, I don't foresee a uh, general election. Uh, I don't foresee any of those items that you have mentioned. Um, certainly, we think that it is a good time uh, having almost halfway through our administration, two years of the five years through our administration, uh, to be able to initiate a new legislative agenda. Uh, as you would know, this is not something that is particular uh, to the country. Uh, there have been many instances in which the House of Assembly has been prorogued for just this purpose, um, notwithstanding that it was prorogued last time. Go to the agenda. Again, Parliament has been prorogued until October 4th. The official opposition not sitting quietly as they slammed the decision by the Davis administration to prorogue Parliament over the weekend, a day after the prorogation was announced by Commissioner of Police Clayton Fernanda. Free National Movement leader Michael Pintard said the decision to prorogue this session of Parliament is the Davis administration's clear admission of guilt and their inability to fulfill the most basic promises made during what he called a honeymoon period. At a press conference on Sunday, Mr. Pintard listed the the opposition are listed what the opposition perceives as some of the failures by the Davis administration. From the towering burden of energy costs, we call it the Davis says increase in electricity, to the unrelenting surge in food prices. The PLP administration has shown a remarkable knack for pushing the Bahamian people further into economic distress. Notwithstanding the conversation about moving more closely to a livable wage, one hand give it, and the other hand, through bad policy, have taken the benefit of that away. Their promises of social assistance, national security, and safety has proven to be nothing but hollow words, leaving citizens to suffer the consequences of their inaction. Affordable housing, accessible transportation, and reliable health care remains elusive dreams under their leadership. Mr. Pindard goes on to criticize the lack of transparency and accountability of the Davis administration. We have told the story consistently that they have failed to comply with the procurement laws and they refuse to tell us with whom they are entering into contracts, what are the terms of these contracts, how long are these contracts. And for those contracts where we have become aware of the details, we often find serious discrepancies. So one can only imagine if we became aware of more of the hundreds of contracts issued for hundreds of millions of dollars. Why are they keeping it a secret who they are spending your and our money with? The Prime Minister cannot escape his record of failure, nor can he evade the questions that loom large over his administration. Questions that their chairman has said, don't answer. In fact, don't show up to work, don't come to Parliament to fulfill a commitment to be accountable to the Bahamian people. 
Mr. Pintard says while the Davis administration in proroguing parliament may seek to wipe the slate clean, he says the opposition and the Bahamian people deserve answers to a number of highly publicized questionable decisions and incidents of the Davis administration in addition to failing to address the issue of crime. Bermuda Gate, Im Immigration Gate, knock down a policeman gate, school construction uh, collapses, the litany of scandals and blunders are staggering. Our deputy has been consistent in commenting on the lack of a comprehensive crime fighting plan and indicate that we do not hold policymakers responsible for crime, but what we do hold policymakers responsible for is being the chief agents who will coordinate all stakeholders in coming up with a concrete plan of action with timetable on how to combat crime. The Davis Cooper administration can try to wipe the slate clean. Yes, they may prorogue the house, but they will not change the minds of the Bahamian people. Mr. Pintard says the opposition is astonished at the decision for a two-month hiatus from parliamentary activities at a time when the nation is undergoing a number of challenges and crises. As the new school year is just a week away, President of the Bahamas Union of Teachers, Belinda Wilson, says there are still a myriad of concerns that the union has in relation to continued school construction and teacher shortages. We are looking at the preparation of schools for the new school year and as I look at several schools we still have buildings new buildings that are building that are up to the bell course as if they didn't know that school was opening in a week's time we have the collapse of a building at RM Bailey so we're definitely going to be asking for a full report and investigation on that and we hope that they had um, put that work out to tender we hope that it was not given to a crony or friend, family, or lover, but to a, a contractor who is skilled, certified, and was able to do that work in a proper manner. So definitely we're gonna be looking at teacher shortages, we're going to be looking at the environment of the school for, um, for back to school. She goes on to know that Many teachers are up in arms as they are still owed for responsibility allowances, confirmation letters, reclassification, and unpaid leave. So they've already marked examinations. They've already done summer school. They've already coached. They've already taken part in, in, in um, various activities, and we're still waiting for funding. Our teachers are not pleased about that. We're having a general membership meeting um, tomorrow to decide what our course of action is going to be. Um, we are tired of hundreds and hundreds of teachers. We're still, they're still awaiting confirmation letters. They're still awaiting reclassification, monies that are owed to them. We have teachers who've written months now asking for unpaid leave. They're still waiting for acknowledgement of receipt of their letter. And they're supposed to be going off to school next week. So there, there are lots of problems in the Ministry of Education. She says communication with the acting director of education is going well, but it is not enough. We have about 3,000 members from Grand Bahama to Inagua, and we represent them to the best of our ability. We try our best to make sure that we are on top of what's happening. We write to the ministry. We send emails. We have meetings. We send WhatsApp messages. We give recommendations. We've written numerous documents to them stating this is a problem and we recommend this is how it is to be corrected. So we hope going forward that something changes. And they said the Prime Minister might be shuffling. My brother, shuffle. Shuffle on. Mrs. Wilson says she has hopes that the Ministry of Education will be able to find solutions to the woes very soon. And finally in this segment, as the country continues into the peak summer season, Bahamas Power and Light continues to address challenges with its Watsilla engines that have been the subject of much debate between the government and the official opposition. In this next report by Cale Campbell, we'll hear how the power giant is trying to address the challenges with the mega generators. 
Bahamas Power and Light has hired a foreign company to conduct structural work on Station A, where the seven Wardzilla engines are being housed. This was revealed by Director of Energy Supply Anthony Christie. During a tour of BPL's power plant at Clifton Pier Power Station, the media was able to see the conditions of Station A. Despite the building's state, Mr. Christie explains what their biggest challenge has been as well as how that challenge contributes to the high electricity costs Bahamians are now paying. I think the main focus has always been the HFO and the fuel availability um, in order for us to run at the cheapest cost. I think that impacts most of us as consumers and customers. And this plant was designed, uh, intended to run exclusively on HFO at all times. So that's part of our biggest challenges is to maintain that in order that we see proper production and, and cost in, in generation uh, from BBL. As the CEO would have mentioned, and, and most people are familiar, there's a fuel charge on your bill. And this fuel charge is a component related to the fuel used to generate electricity. So we have two fuels available, H ADO and HFO. The diesel is a higher priced fuel than the HFO. So in order for us to generate at least cost, we would need to run and produce as much power or electricity on the HFO, which is a cheaper fuel. Right now, HFO is about $74 per barrel on the market. Uh, ADO is around $91 per barrel. So that cost difference is translated onto your bill directly by how much uh, we use to produce electricity. Speaking with reporters after the tour, Mr. Christie revealed that due to the age of the building, which according to him is over 40 years old, its deteriorating state has contributed to the overall issue of the Wardzilla engines not being at optimum level. He goes on to explain BPL's work into fixing issues which were met upon taking over management of Station A from Wardzilla. As part of the contract, it speaks to the plan being handed over back to us in the same state in which it was given. We did not encounter that. So since then, we've been focusing on correcting a lot of these issues in order to get it in a better state. Um, initially, housekeeping was not up to standard. The basement, which you all have taught, floor was pretty much full of oil or water uh, in a large amount of areas. Um, proper pumping systems were not working down there. And that was the first area which we literally uh, focused on to clean up in order to make it safe and um, for, for our staff to go down there in order to handle um, the housekeeping a little better and the sludge movement, et cetera. So that was the main area that we focused on. Then we looked at what systems were not working in the plant. Though admitting that the engines are good, Mr. Christie describes other challenges experienced with the engines, such as maintenance, describing the difficulty and challenge in scheduling maintenance checks, as well as other defects discovered when the Warzilla engines were inspected by BPL. Due to the demand at the time, a lot of the scheduled maintenance was, was delayed, okay? And that impacted us completing a lot of the maintenance on time. Now, at the time, the OEM, Wartzilla, was in charge of that. In addition, the scheduled maintenance that was done on, I think, five of the seven units had a lot of delays and challenges due to logistics, uh, parts being available on time, technicians being available on time. All of this added to delays. So up until the time we took over, they should have completed all of the services or overhauls. But at the time, they did not. So we were left now responsible for two more overhauls that needed to be done prior to summer. And I think a challenge with that is when we started to plan and schedule that overall, then we encountered some major defects related to um, design of the units themselves. We would have found bolts that snap or break. Um, we've had more wear or tear on certain components um, in the crime case, et cetera, that needed uh, proper analysis in order to understand the root cause. So far, five out of the seven Wardzilla engines are running, with two engines needing overhauls. However, the issues noted have not allowed for a straightforward overhaul. BPL is still in communication with Wardzilla with regards to their engines. Officials are hoping what they see on the units that are being repaired now is not similar on other units. If it is such the case, it would cost BPL more time and effort. According to Mr. Christie, up until the time BPL took over the plant, there were a lot of equipment that were not functioning, with some that still aren't. For JCN News, I'm Kale Campbell. Thanks for that report, Kale. We'll take a break here. We'll be right back after these commercials.